well, that was scary. If it was true. Hey guys, Fred Bowler here, the Wildlife Ambassador. In this video, I am going to be talking about the differences between aggression and defense and uh, the overall behavior of the cottonmouth. One important thing that I want to note here is that many, many times, I would say 90% of the time, when people tell me they've seen a cottonmouth or they have a cottonmouth in a bucket or something like that, it's not a cottonmouth. Um, the most common species that is mistaken for a cottonmouth is the banded water snake. So I'm going to I'm going to talk about the little differences between those two species. Differences between the cottonmouth and the banded water snake. Both are very common in Florida. Um, and by the way, there's only two species of cottonmouth in the state of Florida. That would be the eastern in the Florida cottonmouth. The eastern one ranges in the in the north of Florida. So the Florida cottonmouth is the most common. But the differences between the cottonmouth and the banded water snake um, are notable. The head of the cottonmouth has really sharp edges, sharp lines on the top of the head. Here's the banded water snake. You can see uh, the vertical lines that are almost perfect uh, along the lips. And uh, also this gives you a good shot of the eyeball. You'll note that the pupil is easy to see. It's round, unlike the cottonmouth, which is elliptical, like a cat's eye. And as you can see, the pupil of the cottonmouth is very, very difficult to see. It's just so dark, but, the, but it is elliptical, like a cat. The cottonmouth has vertical lines uh, you'll read in literature that it's usually two vertical lines across the lips, but um, it can be many. And the main difference, though, is that they're irregular. They're not as uniform as you'll see on the banded water snake. Banded water snake has very straight, uniform lines across the lips. In the U.S., all the vipers and the cottonmouth and all the rattlesnakes are vipers, are pit vipers, which means they have a heat-sensing pit that detects infrared heat from prey, making it easier for the snakes to locate prey at night. They can get that heat signature and they hone right in on it. It's a pretty cool adaptation. Now, as you can see in the photo, that pit is located between the eyeball and the nostril. It's right in the middle. All right, I'm getting into behavior now. Um, one of the things I often hear when discussing cottonmouth with anybody just stopping on the path or in, in uh, wherever, I always hear somebody say, I was chased by a cottonmouth, or my family member was chased, or a friend was chased by a cottonmouth. And not that I think these people are lying necessarily. Some are obviously telling a big scary story, but... I, what I believe it is, is the snake's behavior being misunderstood. A lot of people don't really understand the differences between aggression and defensiveness. The cottonmouth is not aggressive. Flat out, I've dealt with literally hundreds of, of cottonmouth in many, many, many different scenarios. And so my colleagues and friends that know snakes... And none of them will tell you that the cottonmouth is aggressive. What the cottonmouth is, just like most snakes, is defensive. They have a very, actually shallow zone of influence where you can remove, you can move your, quite close to them without them showing defensive behavior. But then there's these little signs to tell you, okay, you're getting too close. And that is all defensive. In the picture, you'll see snakes starting to put their head up. I think it, when you approach a cottonmouth, if he's feeling defensive or he's feeling nervous about the situation and he feels he can't get away, he or she, they're going to put the head up first. And that's a warning. That's the first warning that you've entered the zone of influence of a cottonmouth um, if they can't flee. Um, and they're not really fast uh, compared to other snakes. And they know that. they got a heavy-bodied snake especially if they're on uh, tarmac or paved road, they can't get a grip. And so they tend to go more defensive. So that head's going to raise. And if you keep encroaching on them and you get about, I don't know, between five and 
three foot away generally, then he's going to coil. The snake's going to coil and say, okay, I can, we can take it further if you want. And again, all this is not aggression. This is defensive behavior. Because if you were to turn around and go away, that snake's not going to chase you. He's going to literally go along his way and get back to what he was doing. So if you keep coming, that snake uh, coils, and you don't heed that, well, of course, he's like, I could be eaten here. I could be killed here. So the next thing to do with a cotton mouth, a lot of times you'll see them open their mouth and they'll, they'll gape. And that's where they get the name cotton mouth is that big white mouth. But although in reality, it's, it's pink. So what he's doing is he's showing, he's got, look, I've got these big old fangs and I've got venom and I'm willing to use it if you push it. Now, these are the primary fangs. You can't see them because they're covered in a sheath, a fleshy sheath, but um, those are the primary fangs. He's got fangs behind those uh, in case he loses a fang. Just about every time they eat, they'll lose a primary fang in the, in the prey, and then another fang will swing in to position, ready to go. And this is just telling you, back off. And again, he's not being aggressive, he's totally defensive. By the way, in the photo, you can see that tube. That's actually called his glottis, and that's the breathing tube. Uh, so they can breathe while they're swallowing prey. In reality, the last thing a cottonmouth wants to do is bite you. He doesn't want any trouble. just wants to go on his way. Um, you would literally have to pick up a cottonmouth or step on one for, uh, to get bitten. And actually, the case histories show and um, at least in North America, probably all over the world, that the highest bite case histories are on people messing with them. And it's, of course, on many videos. Um, and they tend to be young, drunk males. And that's a fact. In this video, you can see the whole process of a cottonmouth becoming defensive. Um, I actually walked up to the snake knowing where its zone of influence was, and also knowing that I wasn't in any fear of being chased uh, by this snake. He told me exactly what he meant, and you'll see that I got right up to that zone of influence where if I did come any closer, he may have struck, but I, I didn't. I chose to respect him and move off, and I moved out of the way, moved out of the way so he showed me his full defensive behavior, and I heeded it. And then I went on my way, and he went on his way. This snake had other things on his mind other than worrying about me. Not one bit interested as I walked up to him to film him. Pretty cool. I walked up on this guy um, on the trail. It just stopped raining, and it's a good time to see Cottonmouth. And he just stayed there. Uh, he didn't... He froze, which is, is what cottonmouth do a lot of times when approached. And he's thinking, do I run or do I keep going or fight? What's this thing going to do? Is it going to eat me? So as it went along, I wanted to, again, prove a, prove a point. He's not going to chase me. So I got close inside his zone of influence, and he put his head up, kind of coiled back a little bit. And then he was like, okay. I don't know what this dude's up to. And he literally turned about face and took off back to where he came from. And uh, I wasn't in any threat whatsoever of getting hurt. Um, and again, I would have just ordinarily just walked around him and kept on going, admired him and kept on going. But again, I wanted to prove a point. Never, ever uh, have I been chased by a cottonmouth. All right, buddy. We're gonna get him out of the way so he, so people don't inadvertently step on him. Or... See how easy that went? Yes. If you're calm, cool, and collected, 
These snakes are no problem. The average length of an adult cottonmouth is between two and three feet. Um, however, they can get larger. And in some scientific journals, you'll see them uh, in literature saying it's up to seven feet, but I've never seen a seven foot, but a seven footer, but I wouldn't doubt it. Bill Host, a world-renowned herpetologist, uh, had the Miami Serpentarium, in which I lived behind that, and I used to go there all the time, and he had a gigantic cottonmouth on display, and he was every bit of six foot, and he was and just had a huge girth, so they can get pretty big. This cottonmouth was filmed by Loretta Elmore, and she sent me this picture. It is a massive cottonmouth. Um, I did a size comparison to the bush around it in the trees. It's every bit of five feet, uh, possibly longer, up to six or so. Massive girth on it. This is male-to-male -male combat in Cottonmouth. I was actually riding a horse and came across this, across this. I was very fortunate. It's a wrestling match between males uh, for dominance. And then uh, the winner gets the female. It's a juvenile Cottonmouth. Um, they're born uh, maybe at about six inches, maybe a little less, five, six inches, I guess. And um, their tail, you look on the end of the tail, that's called a caudal lure. And that's used, they'll wiggle that, and that's used to attract frogs. and just makes it easier for them to catch a meal when they're young. Now, cottonmouth, like all of our vipers in North America, are born live. It's actually called ovoviviparous. And there's a membrane inside the mama that ruptures and all the babies come out live instead of her laying an egg like other snakes do. And the vipers aren't the only one that has this, but definitely the cottonmouth and other vipers in the U.S. Another interesting fact about the cottonmouth, and that is parthenogenic reproduction, parthenogenesis. And that process is actually having young without having a mate or sperm. And with the cottonmouth, Z chromosomes are male, W chromosomes are female, and the mama has all males. Those chromosomes clone and they're all males when they're born. There's no uh, sexual activity um, with another male to bring that on. And they don't really know why it may be Perhaps that she hasn't found a mate um, and all of a sudden she can have those babies without having a mate. And the litter is generally lower in number than it would be from a normal mating, but it does happen. And in this picture, this one's from, uh, this is one of Carl Barden's uh, pictures. He's with Med Thompson and owns a reptile discovery center in D-Land, uh, Florida. And this baby was born by uh, parthenogenic reproduction. Now it's common knowledge that um, some other snake species and few other lizards uh, have the ability to reproduce parthenogenically. Um, but science is now thinking that some mammals, and the higher invertebrates, may be capable of reproducing that way as well, which is very strange in my opinion. Well, I hope that puts your mind at ease uh, about the cottonmouth water moccasins. You can get out there and hiking and literally coexist with nature and uh, just use caution and common sense. And the big thing is respect. You know, they, they belong out there just like anything else in the wild. They have a very important role to do, and that's taking care of rodent populations, frog populations, and, and such. If you're new to Florida, learn about the Florida wilds and the Florida wildlife as much as you can. So you have peace of mind, if nothing else. Use common sense and uh, caution and respect. All those go along with getting out in nature. So we all can be wildlife ambassadors. If you like wildlife, you like going outdoors and seeing everything from bears to bugs, you're an ambassador if you like and spread the word. So I want to thank you very much. This is Fred Bowler, the Wildlife Ambassador, and please stay tuned for the next episode. Mm -hmm.